We are now going to talk about the extension of a 2x2 two two contingency table to an i by j contingency table situation, where capital I represents the number of rows, capital J represents the number of columns. And the way that we're going to talk about it is relative to the multinomial probability distribution that we just examined. One can think of the counts in this contingency table as coming about through a multinomial distribution. The reason why this is important is because uh, particular statistics that we can form based upon the counts in the, in the I by J contingency table, and also then the corresponding inference methods that we will eventually look at, all rely on having an understanding of, <clears throat> excuse me, have an understanding of how this multinomial distribution basically is the probability mechanism behind all this in terms of how counts in a table are observed. Now there are two different ways that one can think about how a multinomial distribution uh, can be used in a situation where you have an I by J contingency table. So this first way is that basically we have just one overall multinomial distribution from which the counts in the table came about. We're going to let capital X denote our row variable and it has levels of I equal 1 to capital I. So um, I equal 2 means uh, let's say row 2 or level 2 of this X. Our column variable is going to be denoted by Y. It's going to have levels of J equal 1 to capital J. And we're going to be very, very interested in the probability that X is equal to I, Y is equal to J. Meaning that the probability, let's say an item, falls in row I, column J. That probability is going to be denoted by pi sub IJ. Now since an item can only fall in only one row and one column, then that means in the, if I were to add up all these pi sub i j's across the rows and the columns, I will get 1. We're going to let n sub i j denote the cell count for row i column j. In other words, let's say the number of items in our sample that correspond to row i column j. Then if I take a sample size of n, what that means is that if I were to sum up all these n sub i j's, I get n. So here are some tables that help summarize this information. First of all, this ta the, the first table uh, represents now these probabilities that we have. So here are my corresponding probabilities. So we could call these joint probabilities because they jointly tell us about x and y. Then the corresponding counts that we would observe in a sample correspond to these n sub i j's. Now note that if I were to sum up across the columns for a particular row, I can get, let's say, pi sub i plus, where in this case where I circled, uh, this corresponds to row 1. So now this represents the marginal probability of getting x equal to 1. I can do a similar thing here as well. Those are my marginal probabilities relative to y. I could also have, let's say, marginal counts too. Okay. Now, here's our probability mechanism that we have for how these counts in the contingency table can come about. I can use a one overall multinomial distribution corresponding to n sub 1, 1 all the way to n sub capital I capital J. And so if I take now the multinomial distribution that we saw in the previous set of notes and now just translate it to this new setting, here's my probability mass function for a multinomial. Notice how I have these probabilities of observing a particular category, or in our case, the particular x, value of x, particular value of y. The maximum likelihood estimates then for these pi sub i j's is what you would expect. Simply the proportion of items that, let's say, fall in row i, column j, 
uh, that's, that's the value. In other words, n sub ij divided by n. So I briefly talked about marginal counts and marginal probabilities. So we can essentially think of, let's say, these counts here as coming from a multinomial distribution as well, where the probabilities with that multinomial are right up there. We can do a similar thing for the column uh, marginals as well. Okay, so let's take a look at how we can simulate a sample now in this particular setting. So this allows us to essentially simulate a contingency table. We will actually look at some um, inference methods later on that take advantage of this simulation approach so that we don't necessarily need to use like a, a large sample distribution, like a chi-square distribution, and instead we can uh, uh, basically simulate a um, probability distribution for a particular statistic. More on that a little bit later. Okay, so let's consider that I have a 2 by 3 contingency table, and I'm going to have 1,000 different observations. This is going to be like our trials that we saw previously when we use when we simulated data with a multinomial distribution. And let's just say that my probabilities associated with it are shown here. So the probability of x being um, equal to 1, y being equal to 1, is 0.2. So to simulate then this sample, let me go ahead and go over here to 10. Go up to the top of the program. So first of all, I'm going to set a seed so I can always reproduce my results. And here's my... Uh, corresponding, um, oops, actually, sorry, I was in the wrong spot. Here are my corresponding pi sub ij's, and I'm going to put these pi sub ij's into a table structure so that we can better see it. And the way I do that is just with the array function is what we've used before when we've entered in two by two contingency tables into R. Same concepts. So let me go ahead and take a look at pi.table, and here we go. So we can see, for example, here's pi 1, 1, it's equal to 0.2. Now to simulate the sample, I'm going to set a seed so I can reproduce my results. I'm going to put the results from the sample into an object called save, for the lack of a better name. And I use my R multinomial function, R multinom function again. I have one over, overall sample, so that's why I say n is equal to 1. The n in our notation actually corresponds to size. So I'm going to have a sample size of 1,000. And then I need to put in all my corresponding probabilities. I put the counts into, again, save. And here we go. Now, this 191 corresponds to um, <clears throat> uh, uh, x equal 1, y equal 1. The 311, or 311, corresponds to x equal to y equal to 1. And what we like to be able to do now is actually see these counts in a contingency table structure. So what I do is I just use the array function once again with these counts. And here's what we get. I put the results into c.table1. And here are the counts. I could find then, let's say, the maximum I could estimate by simply taking c.table1 divided by n. In other words, the sum of all the counts in the contingency table. And this is what I get. So notice how similar, let me see if I can get this on one, one, one uh, window, yes. So look how similar my pi sub ij's are, are to the pi hat sub ij's. We should expect that because we have a large sample size. But I bring this up because it gives you some intuitive feel for how this probability mechanism works when we think of a contingency table arising through a multinomial probability distribution. Okay, let's go back to my notes. Now there's actually a second way that we can think about how counts in a contingency table come about through multinomial distributions. What we can do is think of, let's say, maybe we have i separate multinomial distributions, meaning one for each row. This actually mirrors what we had previously when we had 
a two by two contingency table and we simply had two binomial distributions corresponding to the two row groups. Same thing, but instead of a binomial, now we have a multinomial. Let's talk about this extension and some changes then in the notation to coincide with this um, more general approach. We're going to let n sub i plus be the essentially the um, uh, correspond to our row count. And I guess we've already kind of seen that. So for example, n1 plus corresponds to the number of observations for row one. But in this particular setting, since I have i different multinomial distributions, these values are going to be fixed by design. So for example, maybe you were to go out and take a survey of some people and you wanted to make sure in this survey uh, for your x variable that uh, you had, let's say, 50 people for row 1, 60 people for row 2, 100 people for row 3 corresponding to whatever x is. So in that particular case, the number of trials for the each multinomial distribution would be 50, 60, and 100. You are fixing this beforehand. Previously, when we thought of as one multinomial distribution for the entire contingency table, those row totals were actually random variables. Okay, so since I have different multinomial distributions for each row, that means given my particular row, I'm interested now what's the probability of y sub y is equal to j. So what we have here are actually conditional probabilities. We had that in the 2 by 2 contingency table, but I didn't actually focus on that in that case. But what we have here are conditional probability distributions that we learn about in an intro stat course. We're going to use the common shorthand notation for these conditional probabilities of pi sub j, and then a vertical line meaning given i. So I would pronounce this as pi sub j given i. All this again is, is the conditional probability of observing response category j for y, given an item is in group i for x. Then for each row, I'm going to observe j different counts corresponding to the columns. They each have then the corresponding probabilities as shown there. And if I were to sum these conditional probabilities across the columns, I will get a value of 1. Because if you're, let's say, in row 1, you have to have either a response for y of 1, 2, all the way up to category j. So this is now another view of our table-like structure where we have, again, these conditional probabilities in each row. They sum up to 1. With this structure, then, each row has a multinomial distribution. What happens in row 1 is not going to have an effect on row 2 or 3, so we would actually sometimes refer to this as independent multinomial sampling for how these counts come about. Each Row has a multinomial distribution. So for row i, this is what the multinomial distribution would look like. If I want to now find, let's say, a likelihood function that incorporates information across all the rows, then I just simply put a product out there. Maximum likelihood estimates for pi sub j given i is what you would expect. Um, the cell count for row i column j divided by the total number of items in row i. So that's the corresponding MLE. Note that in a multinomial, in well, one multinomial setting, you could actually end up getting to the same spot as well. And so what you're going to see as we go along, there's actually going to be a lot of equivalences between the one multinomial setting in the I multinomial setting. So how can we actually simulate counts or simulate a contingency table in this particular setting? Well, suppose we go back to having a two by three contingency table again. We're going to have a set of conditional probabilities. And I don't know why I wrote it out this way, but 
given, let's say that we're in row one of the, I guess I did write it out the correct way, excuse me. Let me just do a little bit of racing. So given that we are in row one, here are the probabilities for row one's uh, multinomial distribution. And then given that we're in row two, here are the probabilities for row two's multinomial distribution. Okay. Now I purposely set this up so that results will be very similar to what we had with the one multinomial situation. And so if you remember from a intro stack course, when you had something like this, where you'll learn the basic definition of conditional probability. What this allowed you to do was take joint probabilities divided by a marginal and you get the conditional probability. You could do this as well in this particular setting. So previously I found pi.table, which was all the joint probabilities for the one multinomial setting. If I were to take that divided by row sums pi.table, let me go ahead and do that. Okay, so here's my pi.table. And if I were to look at row sums pi.table, what that will do is find the sum of the probabilities in each of those rows. And if I were to, let's say, divide here, R matches everything up properly. So for row one, it takes the first element of row sums. For row two, it's going to take the second element of row sums. Here's how I get my conditional probability. So pi sub 1 given 1 is 0.4. Pi sub 2 given 1 is 0.4 as well. So then now using these conditional probabilities, what I can do is simulate a contingency table. I set a seed so I can reproduce my results. Then for row 1, I need to use R multinomial, R multinom. And let's say that I want to fix that N1 plus the sample size for row one should be 400, just to change things up a little bit. I get my probabilities out of my first row of pi.cond. Then for my second row, I do something similar, and just to change things up, I'm going to simulate uh, a sample size of 600. So let me, let me go ahead and do that. So those are my two samples for the two different rows. Now let's put these samples together into a contingency table like structure. So I'm going to create an object called c.table to do that. In my data argument of array, what I need to do, remember how array works, is that we need to enter in by column. So I take my first element in the save one um, object. Then I take the first element in my save two um, uh, object. What this corresponds to now is the row one, column one, row two, column, um, let me make sure I said that right, row one, column one, and then row two, column two. I put that into my c.table object, and there's my simulated contingency table. And what you'll notice, if you were to sum across here, you would have 400. If you sum across here, you would have 600. Okay, let me jump back over here to my notes. What one could do as well is let's say find then the corresponding uh, maximum likelihood estimates. How can I do that? Well, I find then the sum for each row and I take each element cor uh, divided by its corresponding row total. Here's what I get. Now, we could go back and take a look at what the true conditional probabilities are and we can see that they're very very similar these are the MLEs why are they similar again because we have such a large sample size on your own you can see that if I went with my original C dot table one that I simulated under the um, one multinomial setting you could find conditional probabilities with that and get something very similar as well Okay, so this is a quick little introduction to how we can think of a contingency table 
as coming about through a multinomial distribution probability structure.